Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back. Uh, we're so excited and grateful uh, to continue today's conversation. And today's conversation is um, the second of, um, of a series of three. And um, it's a three-part HBCU forum series. I'm Halston Sleets. I'm a local DE and I professional who was born and raised in the state of Minnesota. I graduated from an HBCU, Tuskegee Global Partners, <laughs> and returned to uh, Minnesota to work on this on important projects such as these uh, and initiatives. Um, so in today's capacity, I'm representing Ruta Relations, uh, a local PR and DE&I firm that is focused on working at the intersections of race and equity with companies and organizations who are committed to the advancement of um, racial justice through executive coaching and mentorship. Um, in my professional capacity outside of Rooted, um, I uh, serve as a racial justice um, pillar uh, manager for Google, um, but I'm really excited to do this work today. And uh, this forum is sponsored and brought to you all by uh, Greater um, MSP. And Greater MSP, if for y'all who don't know, it's an organization who facilitates connections across industries and organizations uh, together to accelerate the competitiveness and, um, and inclusive growth in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. I'm also joined by um, Emily Fitzsimmons, who is the Managing Director for Make It MSP. And Make It MSP is a strategic initiative under the Greater MSP umbrella um, that aims to make um, our region one of the country's top performers in attracting, welcoming, and retaining, uh, retaining talent. Um, last week, we heard from uh, um, a couple phenomenal speakers who kind of laid the foundation for what this series is um, uh, uh, hoping to accomplish. And um, what we're going to do today is um, um, do, do a quick recap on what was discussed last week um, and then talk about what we're going to um, unpack today and also direct you all to some tools and resources that Make It MSP has been developing um, to aid in the process of starting, what is what is the starting of a, a recruitment strategy look like? Um, but back to last week, we heard from an HBCU alumni who um, relocated to our region for a job opportunity um, uh, with a local company. And she shared, um, she graciously shared her insights um, to what her experience has been moving to Minnesota and brought some awareness to how relocation, community connection, and the value placed on HBCU education can either make or break the, the talent recruitment process. So we're really grateful for the wisdom she shared with us last week. As well as um, we had another professional with us, um, um, an HBCU career services professional um, who reinforced um, through her thoughtful and honest um, um, dialogue what the current status of HBCU ser career services looks like. Um, how they have been receiving a lot of attention and a lot of ask from companies due to uh, the corporate actions uh, and response that came out of the summer of uh, civil unrest of 2020 and, um, and how that caused a lot of activation. But also she shed some light on how HBCUs have been uniquely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and their staffing, their resources, budget, and also time has um, significantly increased and even um, eliminated some of their roles. So um, the hardship that this pandemic has caused, not only um, on it from a, a, a global stance, but the the institutions in which a lot of these companies are companies and organizations are seeking to partner with. Um, moreover, she also emphasized um, that these efforts can no longer be transactional, and that true connection and sustainability uh, come from cultivating and fostering authentic relationships with these institutions and the students. Um, I think uh, both our speakers did a great job at laying the foundation, um, and now we're transitioning into the how. Um, so yeah, so today we're here to learn about several tools, resources, um, and um, hear from, from speakers who uh, can provide, provide a lot of context to what this process can look like and should look like. Um, and um, uh, ultimately, it's, it's for the internal processes of your organizations, so where to start, as well as um, hearing uh, from professionals who are working at the nexus of building relation, building awareness, um, creating connections, and fostering culture shifts that are necessary to retain diverse talent in this region. 
Um, I also want to briefly highlight some tools and resources that you all will have access to to further guide your organization's efforts um, in your HBC recruitment and engagement processes, as well as um, highlight uh, the HBCU strategic framework that my team has been building in partnership with um, Greater MSP for um, about six months now. So I believe that a sec the section that will be most relevant and accurately reflects what we will examine today is the um, initiation with intention. So that chapter specifically uh, addresses strategies to advance um, and apply an intercultural equity lens um, before, during, and after the establishment of a partnership with an HBCU. Um, again, it's imperative for organizations to develop their intercultural capacities before attempting to build authentic relationships with these institutions, as well as um, many of the organizations and companies in this region are, are at the very beginning stages of this DNI journey. So um, being mindful that to mitigate to mitigate the potential harm that um, can be caused by organizations that may be unfamiliar with the interactions um, with interactions across racial differences. So building that muscle of understanding how to build that capacity within your organization before expecting um, the talent you bring in to do it for you. So that is something that that chapter in the strategic plan will cover, as well as initiating, um, initiating partner organizations uh, such as organizations and companies need to consistently work on this cultural development to ensure that their internal operations are supportive for um, a diversifying workforce. So I'll be pointing to some of those um, some of those resources within our time together today. And also we're here we're here more in our um, break off not break off but um, our fireside chat sessions today uh, with Courtney and. Um, uh, John and um, uh, Professor, Co uh, Professor Miller. So um, before we begin, I wanted to, again, thank you all for the time today. A couple slight shifts in how we're going to facilitate today. Um, we are not in a webinar format, so we are in a, in a live Zoom meeting. So if you uh, can adjust your, your, uh, your Zoom uh, um, layout, it may show, uh, you may have a grid of people, you may have a, um, something that shows up as just uh, someone who's speaking. So that box might be highlighted. So it may look a little different for everybody, depending on the preferences you have set in your layout. Um, but we wanted to do this format shift to encourage engagement. So please, I invite you all to um, use the chat function. We'll be um, engaging and asking a lot of questions. Please uh, make the chat function your friend today. We'll also be asking a couple polling questions and invite you all to, um, to share some of those answers. I also want wanted to preface that technology, in my opinion, never works when you want it to. So please extend some grace if it takes a little bit of time uh, between shifts. I'm not foreseeing any or expecting any, but I just wanted to, to kind of ground us in that. Um, so uh, my four ask for today's engagement is to use the chat function. Try and stay on mute um, when folks are talking, just because I, I don't have access to control uh, muting folks, as well as ask questions and engage. So again, thank you for being with us today, and I look forward to some rich conversations. So we're going to jump into the um, PowerPoint presentation, and I'll walk us through the first couple of slides, uh, and then I'll hand it over to Emily Fitzsimmons. But first I want to, excuse the feedback. All right, I think we've got that cleared up. Uh, wonderful. So I wanted to first thank the employer enterprise and community partners team. This forum would um, not be what it is without you all. So again, thank you for your engagement and you've been coming to the table for over two years. So we're super excited that we're at the place uh, where we are now and able to activate and, and mobilize. Um, but this work and this foundation was truly laid by uh, the companies that are um, that you see on the left side of the screen. So thank you so much. And um, the next slide, we are going to uh, do a live poll question. So I know this answer is different for many of the um, organizations we have represented on the phone, but I wanted to uh, just, just ask how far along um, is your organization or company in the planning and executing of an HBCU engagement strategy? Um, so yeah, we're seeing a couple answers coming through already, more than a year, three to six months, um, nine to a year. And again, we um, we know that we're all starting at different places on this journey, but we hope that this coalition can serve as a, um, a collective space to ideate and innovate 
and um, and ulti ultimately um, produce an engagement strategy and approach that has a regional impact, not just an organizational impact. So we have a couple more seconds in that polling. So I will um, I will uh, continue to let this um, move this to the side of the uh, of the screen, so we can start to see some of these answers come in. We're seeing a lot of, about 55% of these answers come at about um, three to six months. So right in the beginning stages. So um, uh, really happy to, to, to see that. And there is some variation. And again, it's, that's okay. <laughs> and the, yeah, what, who, what is the winner? Three to six months. So 55% uh, percent of you all um, are get, again in those beginning stages, and we're so happy that you can um, engage with with that and um, and hear for this forum because we think that like the input and the um, resources we connect you with will aid in the um, uh, the development of this strategy. Also provides some color onto onto. Um, onto what may be missing and provide some context for uh, further understanding why this, the, this strategy um, and engagement is important. So yeah, thank you so much for participating in that question. Um, in the next slide we will cover um, is some of our findings. So a lot of these inform the information that um, went into understanding what, um, what um, is uh, what how to approach HBCUs in terms of these engagement efforts. It's the the what, the where, the when, the how, and the why are immensely important to having um, having these answers before taking the plunge into building these authentic relationships and engagements. Um, so our research on HBCU engagement efforts has led us to conclude that the motivation for getting started exists in three buckets. So um, initiation, investment, and preparation. So I'll briefly discuss these three best practices for getting started and connecting um, and, and resources that we have developed or that are in, currently in the process of being developed to help you all with your um, internal organization's efforts in, in, um, in an HBCU engagement and recruitment strategy. So on the next slide, um, I'm gonna highlight these best practices and um, again, starting. So start with your internal team, invest in, and secondly, invest in long-term student and campus relationships. And third, prepare your teams to answer the tough questions. Ultimately, I, we believe all of these, um, these three best practices build upon one another. And if you go into, um, into your approach and with having some of these already answered, we think you're at a great a great place to to start and, and build something sustainable and intentional. Um, and again, it also takes time to it, it requires some time to take a step back. So answering these uh, questions at the the beginning of your process is a great way to mitigate um, and also be very planful about how you're moving forward. Um, and I wanted to just spend time speaking to each one of these, so providing some context on what we mean when we say start, invest, and prepare, as well as connecting it with a specific resource that has been developed in the, in the process to aid, um, aid this action. So in the next slide, I'm going to discuss um, starting with your team. Um, so starting with your internal team for HBCU recruitment, we understand that um, um, there may be uh, uh, different, I think every organization and company has a different approach to this, but a couple things we just wanted to do to lay the foundation is that um, these questions require thoughtfulness and time. So it's important to not approach these engagements as a numbers game. So how will, it, the first question we have is how will HBC recruiting fit into your organization's larger recruiting and retention goals? We don't want, we think there, what, what, is, uh, what is required in this and what I'm asking in this question is ultimately a mindset shift. This is not just to get black and brown bodies in your company while your organization, um, to advance your organization's uh, um, diversity numbers. Like that is not what we, that is not what we're seeking. If, if HBCU recruitment and, and, and retainment is truly a value of your organization, it can't be something that is looked at or viewed as a supplemental DE&I approach, but ultimately an organizational, um, uh, it needs to be embedded into the model of organizational recruiting. So it can't be a one-off. It, it should be prioritized, um, on your talent teams 
and not treat it as an initiative or supplemental. If the organization truly cares about this work, it's got to be embedded throughout your entire talent strategy. Um, moreover, it's very important to understand that there is a plan for this talent when they come to your organization, a plan to advance and incorporate them, and it needs to be embedded throughout the DNA of the organization going forward. So um, I know we heard a lot of that from our um, career pr services professional last week. So I just wanted to reinforce that, that this is not a DE&I initiative. This needs to be something that is embedded into the entire talent engagement strategy. Next. Have you allocated the right resources? Um, so I mean budget, time, and people for HBCU in, in engagement as a long-term investment. This, again, another, uh, another thing that was highlighted that this can no longer be seen as a, a transactional approach, but ultimately something that um, illustrates commitment and illustrates um, an investment into the students as well as the um, the HBCU in which you are engaging with. So is there has that been allocated? We know a lot of folks are at the beginning of this process and that's okay, but spending some time to be thoughtful about what does this work look like long-term because that's what it requires. Um, and then lastly, has your organization done the important work of building an inclusive and supportive workplace for HBCU alumni once they arrive? Um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, ways in which organizations and companies can leverage what is happening in the communities or in which um, these organizations exist um, to assist in this effort. But ultimately, this really drives at the internal work that organizations must do to ensure that um, the places in which they are asking um, talent to come is inclusive, is doing um uh, as much as they can to advance racial equity within their internal organizations. So, um, and also, like, what does that culture shift look like if that work isn't happening? And how is how is uh, how are these companies being champions champion champions for um, the cultivation of change that is so desperately needed? Um, so, the next slide, I'm going to hand it over to Emily Fitzsimmons, who again is um, is assisting in this effort, and she's going to talk about um, a resource that um, Make It MSP has created to aid in this process. So, Emily, uh, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Halston. Well, as Halston said, so Make It MSP um, through the BMSP partnership developed the Workplace Inclusion Toolkit, which is a free online resource for anyone and everyone um, that includes um, several different lectures and an end-to-end -end process for getting some of these conversations started. So this was launched in 2016. And then um, this year, we've actually introduced new and updated multimedia content around specific questions about leadership, around how bias shows up in the workplace, and also updated our resources list, including um, glossary and terms, um, as well as offering some department-specific workshops. So the way that DEI shows up in a marketing department um, may be different than the way it shows up in HR or legal or even your tech teams. So again, this is free for all users. It can be found at our website at makeitmsp.org backslash bmsp. And it's 100% free. It um, offers 24-7 access. And it's not just for individuals to work through, but it's something that you can truly work through with your teams as well. Um, and as, of course, we'll be sending um, a link for this for you and your teams. And I'll just plug that we do have a um, department-specific workshop um, scheduled for June for legal teams. So be sure to catch that if you're interested. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, in the next slide, we're so I, I appreciate the um, connection to a resource. So again, the start with your internal team and the connecting it, uh, utilizing the uh, BMSP workplace inclusion toolkit can really aid in that process. Um, so the next slide is, uh, is again that second that second best practice of investing. So invest in long term student and campus relationships. Um, again, I, I've um, uh, stated this in, in the previous slides, but it's really important to um, to understand like this 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 work takes time to develop, and um, it it could be over the course of two years, five years, maybe even a decade. But ensuring that there is thoughtfulness and um, intentionality baked into um, your your strategy for engagement is is really important, and what is will keep this work sustained. Um, but a couple, uh, three, three places in which we think are really important for determining what your specific needs for your um, company or organization are, um, and and how um, your strategy can uh, best fit that is location 
majors and industry alignment, as well as existing alumni networks. So for location, determine what are easier transitions for students related to weather and culture. And we know uh, it, it may be easier to get someone from Central State in Ohio to Minnesota rather than someone in at Morehouse in Atlanta to Minnesota. Again, not saying, not discounting that that won't happen, but it may be um, an easier transition for folks. Um, so understanding location and proximity to even some of your, if your company's major um, major headquarters, um, but ultimately the goal is to get them to Minnesota, but maybe an easy way into um, an entry point, maybe in a location that is located directly um, or adjacent or in proximity to that HBCU. Um, majors and industry alignment, target outreach and engagement with specific talent needs in mind. So knowing that, um, I know Angel from Blue Cross Blue Shield, Blue, Blue Shield last week talked about um, the intentional outreach engagement they have with um, um, HBCUs that have specific um, um, programs in the medical field. So having an approach like that is immensely important to understanding the needs of your organization and how the specific talent at these HBCUs um, on, in their programming and where you can you can um, have access to to uh, those specific uh, 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 talent and professionals who have the skills that you're looking for. Um, and then existing alumni networks. Does your organization already have strong alumni networks or local connections that would serve as helpful bridges to students? Um, I know there are a couple companies in the Twin Cities that have a really strong connection um, uh, with Howard University. So um, the Make It MSP team has done some research in understanding which universities have some, uh, which um, universities and which companies have a pretty strong um, uh, uh, population um, that have, that are uh, graduates from specific HBCUs and that are now um, working in some of these Minnesota-based companies. So um, we have ac access to that data and um, also understanding, you know, where those alumni networks exist and how can you leverage the ones that are currently within your organization. So even plugging into some of your affinity groups, your employee resource groups um, for uh, for the development of some of these connections and bridges back to the university um, would be a helpful way to engage. Um, and I wanted to also uh, go into a, a little highlight on um, location, but one resource that really helps with this is the HBCU strategic framework that my team has developed to aid in this process. So answering, um, providing some context to some of these questions, providing um, uh, inf informed uh, uh, directives on how to start answering um, some of the prompts that we've asked already in, in the best practices and getting started. But I wanted to go to like even even the location approach. Um, there's a great resource that um, uh, you'll hear from uh, uh, Courtney today talking about HBC first. But we found these interactive maps um, on um, the on the website uh, that. Um, provide a geographic breakdown of HBCUs and can assist in a targeted um, targeted uh, engagement and recruitment to specific regions and areas. So um, we would say leverage this, this resource, use this resource um, as a way to understand where some of these schools exist and how you can have a targeted approach in your location strategy. Um, the next slide I wanna discuss is the, um, the tough questions. And we know that a lot of, th there's been a lot happening in this region and we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about, like if we weren't honest about what we're experiencing as a region, as a community, and also as a, um, a collective of people who are trying to, uh, to improve these outcomes. So prepare your teams to answer the tough questions. What is fueling the current environment? And we know that these answers are going to be different for each company and organization. Um, but the, I, I wanted to just highlight a couple of things that are really important to keep top of mind. The Minneapolis-St. Paul region has been at the center of recent racial justice movement, the, the recent, recent racial justice movement across our country. And it seems that there's something happening daily, weekly um, that is, is driving this. So not to be Minnesota nice about it, but to be honest about what this means for um, potential talent when they decide to come up here, what this has meant to your organization, and what actions are is your organization specifically taking in the advancement of racial justice if you are taking action? Because we do believe these questions are going to come up. Secondly, 
students are tech savvy and learning much of what they know about organizations from social media um, and in researching organizations at, a, at deep lengths before aligning themselves with these companies. So again, being very mindful that um, if you, if you did make a statement after the murder of George Floyd, that folks can still find that. If you didn't make a statement, um, being prepared to answer why. And if you did, um, also being able to tie it back to actions. So I, I believe there is a microscope on, um, on companies as well as um, an ask for accountability. So those may be questions that you are uh, posed with um, when engaging with students and being prepared and mindful on how to answer those authentically um, as well as honestly is really important. And again, HBCUs recognize the sudden influx of company interest in recruitment, and they may be skeptical about the intent and sincerity of, the, of, of your organization's efforts. And that is valid. Um, so being very clear on what your why is and connecting that to purpose and being planful about what your intentions are when you have these students, these, um, this talent come into your organization. What is the plan for them for advancement, for, um, for retention, and being very honest with them up front, um, because we, we no longer want this to be transactional as it has been in the past. Um, so there's a couple common questions that students may have. So we wanted to just provide, you know, these may be questions that you get, so be prepared to answer some of these. Um, and I, I'll just state a couple that I see on here, but how will I be supported as a professional and as a person? That's immensely important when we talk about connection and community. Um, uh, our, our speaker from last week talked about not only is the nine to five important, but that five to nine as well to ensure that um, retention is, is something that folks are, uh, are focused on. And then how do I navigate Minnesota winters? I know Make It MSP has a, um, actually has a resource for that. So again, you leveraging the resources that this coalition and this and this platform have for you to answer some of these questions will be great. And then again, um, uh, how did your company respond after the murder of George Floyd? That's been a question that we see bubbling to the surface a lot. And then folks can also find some of this information online. Um, but also being able to to speak um, to speak to uh, to what actions have or have not been taken can really make or break um, a, a connection. So being mindful of how important it is to have some of these answers ready and prepared before uh, walking into uh, an engagement with, uh, with students or university. Um, so I wanted to see if there are any questions in the chat function. Um, Emily, do we have any questions that I can um, provide some color and context to? Yeah, so Halston, Andrea Morrison from Blue Cross Blue Shield had a great question about how how do you go about finding contact information for local HBCU alumni chapters if it doesn't exist? So um, you mentioned HBCU first, and I dropped the link to HBCU Connect as a digital tool, but how else might someone um, get connected to an HBCU alumni network? I think that is a great question. It's also something that I have been, uh, <laughs> that I've been, um, navigating myself as well. So um, I, I, I believe the strategic framework that we've, we've created provides some context to that, but getting connected with a uh, alumni network, um, going through the university may be, may be, um, may be the best, one of the best options. Um, we have a lot of listservs on universities that have um, connections to the local chapters and then usually like a listserv email. Um, I, I have used that in the past. I think that's been really helpful. But also, though, we know that the um, sometimes the the checking of that and the frequency in which folks can get connected with that doesn't happen as uh, often or as frequent as we would like. So um, I would say uh, a lot of these personal connections with alumni who are living in this in this region um, have allowed folks to connect back to the uh, back to the alumni organizations. So um, again. I think that's there's many ways in which we can we can um, uh, address that, but um, I too have kind of found that a, a little bit challenging. Um, but the strategic framework has some context in there that will, um, will that can provide um, provide some insights on how to move forward in that. Great. Well, Halston, we have no other questions. Oh, all right. That's great. Thank you. Um, so Emily, I think I'm going to hand it back to you to uh, 
I think we might have a polling question before we have Courtney speak. Um, yes. So now that we've worked through kind of these three main um, takeaways and strategies that we want um, you all to be able to take back to your team, we want to pose the question is where do you actually see the most opportunity for progress within your own organization? Where do you see um, the big, biggest opportunities or where are you running into the biggest obstacles? So we'll give everyone a few minutes here to finish the polling question. And something that if you're done answering the polling question that we invite you to do as well is drop, you know, what are the other tough questions that you're hearing from, um, from students as you're recruiting about the region, about your organization, about how you're supporting particularly Black students and alumni? Um, feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll share those out with um, the full registrant list and share whatever resources we have to address those questions as well. So it looks like we have about 25, 26 responses. We'll give it five more seconds here until we move on to our conversation with Courtney Gray from HBCU First. Okay, so I'll share out those, the results here. It looks like we've got um, investing in long-term student and campus relationships. So definitely the underpinning of what Halston has said is, is most critical is also what um, we're across our organizations are finding most important. And then also starting with your internal team um, being the second as well. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for participating in that. Um, Brittany, if you want to advance to the next slide, we can um, introduce Courtney Gray. So we, today we have Courtney Gray from HBCU First. Um, is, this is an organization um, that is located both in New York City as well as right here in St. Paul. So HBCU First is a nonprofit startup with a mission to increase college success and career access for Black youth. HBCU First believes that historically Black colleges and universities should be the first choice of college-bound Black youth and diverse talent-seeking organizations. As the nation's leading HBCU internship program, they help Black youth navigate the college to career journey and bridge the gap between learning and doing. So Courtney, I saw you jump on. Um, I'm wondering if you can um, jump on the screen here and we'll say hello. Sure, hello. Hi Courtney, how's it going? Uh, great, how are you? I'm doing, doing well. Well, I made you co-host, so we should okay. be able to, to work through these slides. So Brittany, will you um, bounce us to the first slide here? Awesome. Well, Courtney, it's really good to see you again. I know we've been connecting a lot over these last few weeks, just thinking about, you know, what are the most important findings that you're hearing and the messages that you want to relate to employers? But before we really dive in, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about, you know, what spurred this idea for HBCU First and what the mission of the organization is? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, our mission is, is pretty straightforward. So it's to increase college success and career access for Black youth. Um, is, can you guys hear me okay? Am I loud enough? I have a tendency to be a little low. I can hear yes. you. Okay. Okay, yeah. great. And so it, it all started with um, really in the summer night, 2019, just really briefly. Uh, my oldest son was uh, finishing up high school and he was about to begin his college career as a chemical engineering student. I was terrified as his parent. I just felt holistically as a young man, um, he wasn't prepared for that journey. Did some research, discovered it was a generational thing that was global. Um, on top of that, I'm a proud HBCU grad myself. I graduated from Florida A&M University way back when. And the conversation around HBCUs was a bit different back then. And um, it was more about, you know, closures and, and viabilities and things of that nature. Um, so that had kind of gotten to a, an action point for me where I wanted to do something to try to help. And then the third thing, uh, just really briefly, having been in the business community for a while, and just being very aware of these trends um, with new job opportunities, you know, tons of, you know, fantastic, highly skilled, high paying jobs being created almost on a daily basis, but yet made it hard work to these opportunities for some reason that are in abundance. 
And so those three things came together. I called up our co-founder, Roy, who's um, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And, you know, he said, hey, let's let's start something where we, where we involve Black youth in the end and pay them well on the way, if possible. And HBC versus born. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Courtney. And Brittany, if you jump us to the next slide, Courtney, I have a question to you about, um, you know, what you mean by, you know, bridging this gap. So um, you've, you've relayed to me that, you know, the promise of your organization is that as the nation's leading HBCU internship program, you're helping youth navigate that college to career journey and that there are gaps that continue to rise to the forefront of that experience. Can you talk a little bit more about what those barriers and gaps are and um, how intensely they impact HBCU talent in their journey? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what I've discovered just based upon formal research, a lot of conversations with um, organizations really looking to make a difference and get right on diversity. And then just talking to a lot of practitioners um, at HBCUs is there's, there's two gaps that I see. Um, just expectations and just soft skills. Um, the students don't know what to expect, you know, and which is understandable because stuff is changing at such a rapid pace. And secondly, there's just a soft skills gap. Um, you know, we're in this new economy. Um, by and large, our approach towards preparing students for uh, the professional workforce after college hasn't been really updated in a major way in about a century. So we're dealing with the impact of that now. And so there's this soft skills gap that is not the student's fault. It's definitely not the, the, the professor's fault. It's not the institution's fault. It's not the company's fault. It's just as a community globally, I would say we just need to come together and work it out. And so we've developed some programming that we feel directly addresses these gaps, again, in terms of the expectations and some of those soft skills. Yeah, thanks for... Thanks for bringing that to light too. And, and if Brittany, if you can advance to the next slide, you know, something that we've also talked about is just, you know, where the students are and where the employers are too. So um, as, um, as we pull up the next slide, we know that, you know, you've worked with a wide variety of partners, um, including some that aren't, aren't on the screen and that are, you know, very familiar with the members in this call, like the Science Museum of Minnesota. But can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, like when and why companies have come to you and kind of like where you're seeing where they tend to be at um, in this, you know, journey of starting their HBCU engagement strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just feel that, you know, as, you know, Halston has addressed, um, you know, we're in the middle of this racial reckoning that really, you know, started, um, you know, with this intensity, um, you know, last year with the murder of you know, George Fuller, Breonna Taylor, and what it's done is, is given us all an opportunity to just reset and do better. And so, you know, when we're approached by organizations, that's what they're trying to do. And that's what we're trying to do as an organization. And I think we're all doing that as individuals. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, a big part of it is just how we start the conversation and, and kind of like that onboarding process. And it's just a very candid conversation about two things, um, just where folks are, organizations are with their diversity. And the second thing is just where they are in terms of their student engagement. And, you know, we don't get into, um, you know, what, you know, what we could have done better in the past, and, you know, all the other thing. It's about just really looking forward and just trying to do better, you know, I would say. That's awesome, Courtney. Thank you for sharing that. And we have a question for, from the group, if you're willing to, to answer this here. We've got um, from Andrew Morrison at Blue Cross Blue Shield. You know, it, are the companies in MSP, are they facing any unique challenges that other geographic areas aren't? Is this what you're, are you hearing um, differences across the MSP region versus others in your work? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I would I would just say uh, to qualify, we're all I would say generally speaking, facing the same issues. And again, it's just you know doing better and preparing youth for this new world that's rapidly evolving. Um, speaking to maybe specific things that are maybe amplified in uh, the MSP region, um, 
you know, just dealing with, you know, the weather, as Halston said, and just, you know, obviously the lack of um, racial diversity makes, you know, the Twin Cities, where it happens to be my birthplace, um, not the most desirable place for, you know, Black and Brown people. It's just not, you know, it's cold. There's not a lot of Black and Brown people there. Um, at the same time, I believe it creates a great opportunity. You know, just in my interactions with, uh, you know, business leaders and it just friends that I have in the area, it, there's a greater sense of community and a greater sense of urgency to do better. And I think it, there's just a, a huge opportunity for leaders in the area to really just to continue to cooperate and to work together and just get that, you know, get that message out, let people know all the great organizations in the community that are doing great work, big organizations with a lot of great opportunities. And then also just, you know, these lessons learned being in the middle and the center of this racial reckoning. That's great, thank you for that. Well, Brittany, if you move us to the next slide, Brittany, I'd like to ask you a little bit about, you know, some of this work that you're helping your partner um, organizations do to get started. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, the programming that you've worked on with companies here in the region and elsewhere and, um, you know, how, how these three different program areas are helping address some of those issues um, and see some of the opportunities that you've noted too? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we, we have a couple of different partnership programs. Our flagship program is called HBC Talent Consortium. It is a series of high touch student engagements. It's about bridging you know, the gap um, as, we, as we referenced. So before I was speaking to the expectations and soft skills gap, and I would just say, you know, just at a higher level, you know, there's this big trust plus expectation gaps between the students and industry leaders. Students don't know what to expect when they graduate from college. Um, us as industry leaders, we don't know what to expect from the students because just the range of preparation is so vast. Um, and then secondly, you know, there's a huge trust gap. Um, the students don't trust us on a personal level. I can speak to this just as a parent. Um, so of course they don't necessarily trust all of our judgments either in terms of businesses, uh, in terms of being businesses. And just really briefly, um, you know, this is a very tough environment for students, you know, dealing with the direct pack impact of global, um, you know, of climate change. A lot of them have experienced gun violence in schools. Um, you know, social media is getting more and more prevalent and there's a lot of downsides to that as well. Um, this economy is unpredictable. So they don't know what's gonna be there or not gonna be there for when they, you know, graduate. And then of course, lastly, they're in the middle of a once in a, one in a, once in a century global pandemic. Um, so they just look at, you know, there's all these problems, the conditions aren't that, aren't that great and they haven't been at the reins. So there's going to be a natural distrust that goes beyond any particular organization or dealing with, you know, racial stuff or any of that kind of stuff. And then conversely, on our side as industry leaders, uh, we don't necessarily trust the students <laughs> either just because they don't trust us, I would say. And so we've developed this framework. It's based upon engagement. So getting away is, you know, from as Halston, you know, stated from just transactional stuff. Right. And this is about building relationships. So we came with these three key engagements. The idea is first and foremost, you know, students, particularly when you're talking about HBCU students, what's really important to them is, you know, racial and ethnic diversity. So if you say you're diverse, they want you to prove it. Does that go beyond gender identification and, um, you know, things like that? Well, yeah. So a way to do that is to have two or three black executives show up from your organizations that are thriving and just simply have them share their career journeys and tips. It goes a long way with the students. Second engagement opportunity we have is, you know, um, an, an opportunity for you guys to educate. You know, that's our masterclass series. Have two to five associates, they don't necessarily need to be black and just come and do, you know, one of two things or even maybe a combination, just offer some industry education. There are so many industries out there there's too much, it's too much for students to, to get into and track on their own. So they need help. Um, secondly, you know, you could do a Skillshare and that's what we offer. So you get really specific. 
for instance, one of our, you know, one of our partners um, next week when we kick off our summer cohort, they're doing a finance one-on-one, actually doing budgeting live with students, you know, in, in a one-hour session. Then the last component of this uh, framework partnership opportunity that we've created is just about gaining insight. So it's flipping the script. And instead of, you know, the students asking us questions as industry leaders, um, you know, we ask them questions. We're all trying to do better and be better, you know, whether it's an initiative that we have, you know, with people within our organization or people we're trying to attract, or whether it's an initiative on a product or a service that we're developing or offering. So, you know, let's go beyond and supplement what we're doing with ERGs and other, you know, other groups and focus groups that we have. And let's go to gener Generation Z directly and let's ask them, hey, how can we attract you as, a, as Black early talent? And furthermore, how can we keep you or retain you if you choose to work with us? That's excellent. And I want to, I want to jump in on one of those points that you've mentioned, which is like centering, um, centering the students in this work. So Brittany, if you can actually jump ahead two slides to the slide with the circle graphic. Um, I want to, because Courtney, I know we're coming up on time here and I want to make sure that we're able to get through this, but can you talk a little bit about the process that you built, not only to center the voices of HBCU students, but also involve them end to end in the programming? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I mentioned, one of our co-founders, Roy, he's a, um, he's a FAMU alum, as I am, Florida A&M University. We also have another board member who is not an HBCU graduate. And fortunately for us, he's an agile coach and a certified scrum master as well. And, you know, he said, hey, you know, let, let's, let's bring, you know, an agile framework to what we're doing with the students. And, and that's what we've done. And it's based upon, you know, three things. We have our events and activities we do. Um, at the end of each event or activity that we do, we do a SPR or a student pulse report to get immediate, you know, real-time feedback from the students on that, on that event or activity. And then the third week thing we do is each week we take a look at that, those reports, um, and we have reported out um, by our internal primary research team, which is one of our programs, a, a report that includes key findings and, and actionable recommendations. And we take that and each week we just get better. And there's a constant feedback loop um, which is enabled by this unique structure we have as the nation's, you know, only national HBCU student-led organization with significant impact. So the students are involved in the end. So they're they're putting together these surveys, they, they're completing the surveys, they're reporting the surveys, and they're implementing the recommendations that we get from these surveys and these um, these many research studies. So everybody comes into our program with one goal. So all the students in our program are paid interns and they all have one singular goal and that's to make the program better for the next cohort. That's it. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, that's so, that's exactly the type of centering that we want across all the work that we do. And my final question for you, because I know we're at time, is this seems like something that organizations could do alone. Right, they could go about doing this um, just within their organizations. But part of what we're trying through this forum and through bringing everyone together is to say that we actually have power in numbers of doing this together and coming together as a region um, to do better at engaging, recruiting, empowering, um, and elevating Black talent. So, in addition to like the product outcome that you have, you know, for the students, why would you say? Um, is the value in doing this through an organization like HBCU First? Why, what is the value for companies coming together um, and doing this um, through a partner like your organization? Well, I would say a couple of things. So for one, there's just an opportunity for more cooperation and better learnings. So, you know, and then secondly, I would just say um, everything that we do is customized and company focused. Um, so going back to the better opportunity for learning and corporate, um, you know, cooperation, um, we share lessons learned from everything that we do with our partners 
on a weekly basis. So if we do a, a program or an activity with company, company B, we do an activity with company C, there's some things that don't go so well, guess what? We share those things with, with, with company D. So it's a way for organizations to cooperate um, and not have to worry about, you know, a sharing of, um, you know, intellectual property or anything like that. It's just about leveraging experiences and getting better. Secondly, in terms of just when I say, you know, it's customized, it's company focused, um, we have a unique platform and approach. Everything that we do is just one company at a time. So we don't have events where we have, you know, five, 10, a dozen, 100, 200 organizations together piled in a room trying to, you know, gain attention. We do it one at a time. So, hey, Wednesday that we have this event and, you know, Minnesota Corporation is here Wednesday it, and the students have, you know, your full attention um, and you're not sharing the floor with, with anybody. That's great. Well, Courtney, I'm so grateful that you joined us today and I want to give you the chance to, to offer you know, anything that you weren't able to, to cover today or a parting message um, for our employers in the call? Um, yeah, I wanted to say, I forgot to start off. Um, I'm just extraordinarily happy to be here. <laughs> this is like a homecoming for me. And, um, you know, I really appreciate you all giving me an opportunity to just share some of my experiences and thought as a practitioner in this space. You know, and I want to just thank all of you all for taking, you know, the big step of step of just being an active participant, um, you know, in a forum like this, in this conversation, because this is where, you know, change um, really happens and really gets started. Awesome. Well, thank you, Courtney, so much. And with that, everyone, I'll just let you know that we'll be sharing, you know, the HBC First platform and, and contact information. So it'll be free to, to reach out to Courtney and his team. But with that, I'll kick it over to Halston to get us started on our second um, conversation today, our fireside panel with John Harper and Professor Colin Miller. Absolutely. And again, Courtney, thank you for an amazing job in really grounding us in uh, the importance of cooperation, collaboration, and connectivity across companies and students. Like, Wonderful. So thank you so much. And we're really grateful for the work that you and your organization are doing. Um, and next, we have a fireside panel chat with um, uh, John Harper, who's the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at South Central College, and Professor Colin Miller, the Director of the School of Technology at North Central University. So we're super excited to have them share their insights on um, on the Minnesota nice culture. Uh, I think that's an important conversation that a lot a, a lot of our organizations have uh, uh, may have avoided in the past or just really can't articulate what that means. And also what does that mean for black and brown people? Because it means something different, um, but being aware of how to navigate that and answer questions that may um, may present themselves when talking to students is immensely important to, um, to to, to being authentic and to being intentional and purposeful. So I wanted to start out with welcoming um, uh, Professor Miller and John to our session. And uh, the question I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna throw it to you first, Professor Miller. Um, and both of you, I would I hope they both can answer this one question first. But um, please tell tell us a little bit about yourselves and uh, and why you chose to reloc relocate to Minnesota. And if you have any HBC connect. HBCU connection, uh, please let us know what that is. So welcome and thank you. So Professor Miller, I'll hand it to you. Well, hello everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be on the call. Uh, just to give a background um, and I'll go all the way back. I was born in Jamaica. I grew up in New York and then I uh, went to school in DC. I, I, I went to the City College of New York and did two years there and, and wanted, wanted something more. And so I transferred to Howard University, and that's where I got my bachelor's. Um, my major was management information systems out of the School of Business. Also at Howard, I had the opportunity to pledge Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And so just my experiences at Howard was, was life-changing. It, it, it helped me to find my voice. And, and you know, I'll talk about that a little bit more. 
but just going having the HBCU college experience helped me to find my voice. Upon graduating from Howard, I was recruited by Kraft General Foods. They're now Kraft Foods. Um, and did started my career there again in information technology and worked in the Chicagoland area for some 20 years. Um, along the way, I had gotten born again. I became a born again Christian and also received a calling to be a minister. And in that calling, uh, the Lord directed me to move to Minnesota. It was time and said, and primarily to uh, start a ministry. I'm also a pastor here in Minnesota. And so that's what brought me to the Twin Cities. And the company that brought me was General Mills. I was recruited by General Mills. And so they were able to bring me here. And so I've been working in uh, IT for some time now. And uh, to fast forward from General Mills to now, um, I'm a IT professor in North Central University and also the director of the School of Technology. And so what brought me here was ministry and yet still being in corporate America and then ultimately in academia. I'm still, so I'm doing dual, dual roles now as both a pastor and also as a professor and director. Thank you, Professor Miller. Now I'll ask the same question to you, John. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my road is actually very similar to Dr. Miller. So Dr. Miller, uh, you and I will try to chat offline. We got a lot to do, discuss, sir. Um, I'm actually originally from Minnesota, um, 40th and Clinton, just to be exact. For those of you that grew up in Minneapolis, you know we always like to say the street name uh, for a couple of different reasons. And so I graduated and upon graduating from Minneapolis Washburn, I made the decision to go to North Carolina Central University and it is by far one of the best decisions I could have ever made in my life. Um, I've lived in a few different places in the United States, you know, as a child, but you know, you're in Minnesota, we're going to dive into it um, and some of the other questions. But that historically black college and university changed my outlook on life. Um, you see me kind of wearing a tie right now. I used to get teased a lot coming back to Minnesota and uh, the college campuses that I go to because people said like you're overdressed and all this other stuff but at North Carolina Central University regardless of what academic program you're in you're expected to look sharp um, I learned more about myself how I process information how I process uh, my own personal emotions my own spiritual growth and what it is I really feel like I wanted to do and what I wanted to accomplish in life. Um, I made some lifelong friends there. I am the godparent to a lot of different <laughs> children that are currently still in the North Carolina area. Um, they've been in my weddings. I've been in their weddings. I ended up coming back to Minnesota for two reasons. One, um, I had some family stuff going on with my mother and my grandmother at the time. And so it was important that I be home. But two, similar to Dr. Miller, I got called home. Um, the day before I was actually supposed to go back to start my sophomore year. And it was one of the toughest decisions I had to make, but um, I heard the voice of the Lord clearly and God don't make no mistakes. And so I ended up going to Minnesota State University, Mankato. And that first year and a half back in Minnesota was hard. It was almost like a reculture shock, um, but I believe we're gonna dive into that a, a little bit later, but I stayed uh, down in the Mankato area, uh, graduated with my bachelor's and my master's degree from Mankato State University. And now I'm the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at South Central College. I've been here for over five years, reporting uh, directly to the president and sitting on the president's cabinet. Um, and now I'm excited. You can probably all see my background. I apologize if it's like flipped or reversed. I will be attending the Morgan State University starting in the fall to obtain my doctoral degree. It was important to myself that that I started at an HBCU, but more importantly, that I at least finish at one. Thank you both for sharing. Congratulations, John. Um, my father's a graduate of Morgan State, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, um, I wanted to just dive right into this really important conversation about the, the unique culture that is Minnesota Nice. So I would love some insights on what that means to you or has meant to you. And then um, what it's what is that experience felt like? So meet the meaning of Minnesota Nice to you as a as a black professional, as well as the um, uh, what is that experience 
uh, looked like. And we can start with uh, Dr. Miller. All right. Um, so what has been your experience with Minnesota Nice Culture? Uh, first, uh, to, to get into it, we need to define what it is. And so in my research, uh, it's defined as, according to Wikipedia, Minnesota Nice is a cultural stereotype applied to the behavior of people from Minnesota, implying residents are usually courteous, re reserved, mild-mannered, and passive-aggressive. Now, aside from, except for passive-aggressive, everything else sounds nice. And, you know, um, sounds nice, courteous, reserved, mild-mannered. But uh, we need to dig in deeper into, in terms of what that means. So for example, polite friendliness means just that. Polite friendliness is just that it doesn't mean interest in being friends or imply any future obligations. Um, An aversion to conflict and confront. Uh, Minnesota Nice makes it hard to confront and to be confronted. A tendency toward understatement. A, dif a difficulty to tell others when they have done something well or exceptional. For fear, if I give you a compliment, you might get the big head. A reluctance to make a fuss or stand out. Minnesota Nice causes people to squirm under the spotlight. Let's keep it even keel, let's keep it low key. Uh, emotional restraint, again, maintaining a low keel, maintaining an even keel. Self-deprecation. Minnesotans are more likely to undervalue or belittle, belittle themselves or others. So to give a com compliment or to receive a compliment is not always taken, you know, and I've seen this. Uh, resistance to change. And I'll give a story. Minnesotans tend to be born, raised, and continue to live in the same town surrounded by the same friends they've had since baby play dates and pre preschool. And what I've found as an East Coaster is that, and I don't want to stereotype, but I see that many Minnesotans typically stay in Minnesota. They don't go anywhere else for vacations. They will tend to stay in Minnesota. And so it's not unusual to find a professional that has never been out of the state. And so what that brings is challenges when you have people from various parts of the country, various parts of background, and they come with a different perspective. With the Minnesota nice perspective is we need to all be on the same page. There needs, there needs to be no difference Everything needs to be the same. And so I was in a meeting, and this goes back early in my career, when I first came to uh, the Twin Cities. We were discussing um, help the support. Now, the people that were in the room were trained professionals and uh, seasoned professionals in their experience. And so we were trying to determine the scheduling for us to support the help desk, which was an entry-level position. And I said in the meeting, why are we doing this grunt work? Now I'm fresh coming from Chicago. Chicago is a state city where they speak directly. And I grew up in, I born in Jamaica, grew up in New York. My style of communication is direct and to the point. And so I said, why are we doing this grunt work? We, you know, gotten years of training and, and spent thousands of dollars for the kind of training that we have in technology. Why are we doing the front level work? I thought we were the back level support. When I made that statement, the entire room got quiet. And that was my first experience and exposure to Minnesota Nice. The entire room got quiet. They looked at me and they didn't say anything. And then the next person moved on to the next point. So my, my comments was not addressed or um, uh, uh, there was no attention to it at all. The next number of days, I ended up having meetings with my boss. And it turns out that everybody in that room went back to my boss and told him what I said in the meeting. And he basically let me have it. So that was my first experience in, in learning about the Minnesota Nice 
culture and the passive aggressive behavior. And that's the last point, passive aggressiveness. Passive aggressiveness hides out beneath the surface. Look for signs like procrastination, sullenness, stubbornness, silent treatment, or confusion, and it's likely you have hit a passive aggressive behavior. And so as I've seen throughout my career when I've been in a meeting, and I've had to learn through the years since I've been here, I came to Minnesota in 2006, and still having to learn and navigate when to speak and when not to speak, and do this in such a way where I'm not losing who I am. And passive aggressive, I guess, is the ultimate byproduct of Minnesota nice. Everything seems okay, but then later on, you find out there were some issues. And I'll talk about more later how to actually navigate that. Dr. Miller, I think you gave an, uh, an excellent presentation and understanding of the Minnesota nice culture. It was very academic. I'm gonna go a little bit different. Um, I 100% agree with you in everything that you said as it relates to Minnesota nice culture, but we have to take it a step further and uh, bring some truth to power. Uh, Minnesota nice is rooted in American exceptionalism, right? This uh, monolithic thing that we believe that we are exceptional at every single thing that we do. And because we believe that we do everything right and that we're inherently better than everybody else, if you do not assimilate to our culture, we will destroy you. And what do I mean by that? Minnesota nice culture is not just passive aggressiveness. It's demeaning. It asserts dominance, especially over individuals of color. Um, you, Dr. Miller, you talked about, you know, uh, everybody needs to be on the same page. They have a very specific page. And mind you, I'm from Minnesota. So I'm speaking from personal experience growing up here in the state and then living here in Southern Minnesota. Their page is their page. It's also rooted in pride, but not the type of jovial pride and joy that you get from feeling accomplished. It's wrongful pride that is rooted in nothing more than what they believe to be right. And if you challenge their notion of being right, they have various ways and uh, rooted in microaggressions that can make an individual not want to come to Minnesota. Um, I think about a couple of different situations where I was having a conversation with uh, faculty members a couple of years ago and they, they made this comment, and I'm sure some of you have heard this comment. And they said, well, and they're referring to an individual color who was with us at the college for a certain period of time and then transitioned um, out to the East Coast, actually. And they made this specific comment. Well, you know, it, they just weren't a good culture fit. And I stopped them immediately and I said, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you know how we do things here. And I said, no, I don't. Now, mind you, I'd been at the college for a while and I knew exactly what they're saying, but I wanted them to say it out loud so they could actually confess what a lot of us know to be true, that their definition of culture and their definition of fit and their definition of Minnesota nice was rooted in so many things that are detrimental to our society, detrimental to any group and organization, and rooted in some forms of racism. So we have to remember that while Minnesota and the culture of Minnesota nice, everybody's like, oh, they'll stop and they'll help you and they'll do X, Y, and Z just to make sure you're okay. That is actually not the experience as it pertains to people of color. It's just the opposite. But of course, as we talk about Minnesota nice, no one thinks it's a problem because the majority group doesn't see it as a problem because it is their culture. And because it is their culture, if you challenge it, they're supremely upset and supremely offended. But it takes individuals, um, a lot of you that are in this uh, seminar, we thank you for your time and your effort. It's gonna take individuals like you to actually stand up and raise the white flag and be bold enough to say, we have a culture problem because the culture that exists is not conducive to helping individuals of color. It's not conducive to helping women and other uh, racial and ethnic minority groups as well. And so when we talk about Minnesota nice, oh man, it's a topic I think myself and Dr. Miller could talk about all day. Yes, sir. And you know, as you stated, it, it truly is a culture problem. And then I'll talk about that later, 
given the fact that it's a culture problem and it, 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 it stems historically from the Scandinavian culture. You know, we understand that Minnesota, or if, if you didn't, was primarily settled by Norwegians and, and, and Danes. And, and that mindset, that, that, that kind of behavior came from Scandinavia and has, has uh, infiltrated, if you will, the culture. And it's, it doesn't just apply to whites, but it also applies to blacks. And if you're not careful, you could move. You could be a, 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 a person that has migrated or moved here, and have assimilated into that culture. And so it's a cultural uh, situation. And I even dare say, as we're talking about Minnesota Nice on this call, somebody on this call is being offended by it. You know, there's over 30 people on this call. And as you said, it's a part of the culture. And so there don't, may not seem to be a, any need for change. And the fact that we're talking about it and exposing it, there's some on this call right now that are being offended. I really appreciate the, uh, the rich dialogue and the honesty and the transparency about what Minnesota Nice truly means and how you both have been um, experienced and witnessed it. Um, and it's something that definitely requires all of us to, to activate and, um, and, um, and come together to shift and change. But I had a question of um, what is one thing that employers can do to improve their internal workforce to be more inclusive to HBCU um, uh, talent when they get here or diverse talent? Um, because the Minnesota, Minnesota Nice clearly isn't working. So there's one takeaway that these employers on the call can, can, um, can um, adopt that can, can aid in this process. And John, I'll throw it to you first. A couple of different thoughts and ideas. Um, first and foremost, I would ask, what is your relationship as the employer like with your HR department? Are you and human resources on the same page? Everybody has an affirmative action plan for the most part, right? And if you don't, like I got some other questions we should probably talk about. But one of the things that you could do is make sure you're intentional. Very, very intentional, not just in your marketing material, in your language. That's the, that's the easy stuff. That, that's the surface stuff. But are you intentional about providing a holistic and um, inclusive environment for individuals of color to come to your corporation? Do you have peer mentors, people that look and talk and can uh, relate to the individuals that you are trying to bring in? Um, sometimes we have the conversation going back and forth. It's like, well, we don't want to lean too heavily on, you know, our maybe three or four people of color because then it creates burnout. That's where you as an organization got to figure out what you can do to support the people that you already have there so they can support the individuals that are coming. You also got to be willing to uh, look at yourself in the mirror and be completely honest with yourself and not ignore the complaints and the cries that come from in, uh, that these individuals are talking about in your organization. You can't just simply say, oh, that's something minor, you know, we'll just brush it aside. You need to look for consistent patterns and trends and don't silence the individuals that are trying to quote unquote, uh, how you may feel rock the boat, but they're actually trying to bring attention and awareness to some of the gaps and the holes that your organizations have. I mean, you brought them in from the inside, from the outside for a reason, right? Lean on them, use them, respect them. I'd also say, and let's be perfectly honest, pay them, show them that they show them that they matter, right? Um, cutting a check will help to a certain extent, and then you need to continue to do all the other stuff. But when we look across national trends, women are severely underpaid as it pertains to their male counterparts. African American women specifically are underpaid as it pertains to their white female counterparts. African American men are underpaid. Hispanics are underpaid. Asianic Pacific individuals are also underpaid and folks that are indigenous are underpaid. And so put your money where your mouth is. It actually does matter. Um, I would also say, there's a couple of things I want to say, but I'm, I'm gonna throw it to Dr. Mill. All right. So. I want to share this quote, and it comes from the um, 
the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits Conference 2019. Minnesota NICE aims to create an inclusive basis for consensus, but its habits can result in an exclusive social order. Now, for HBCU graduates, we have been trained, we have been, we celebrate our individuality. And so in, in, that, in, in, in that there's individuality, there's uniqueness. Employers first and foremost at HR, at the HR level need to acknowledge that there really is such a thing as Minnesota nice. And so for the, those who are in the audience that are a part of HR, you need to understand that. And as, as John has stated, you know, since it's a part of the culture, they may not even recognize, they may not even realize that there is such a thing as Minnesota nice. And in terms of their definition, say, well, Minnesota nice is really being nice. Anytime you hear someone that says, well, Minnesota nice is really being nice, that's a person that does all of the characteristics of the bad side of Minnesota nice. So recognizing that Minnesota nice is a real thing, it's real. And for those of us here on this call, we need to recognize and understand that. For most Blacks that have experienced Minnesota nice in a predominantly white work environment, Minnesota nice can feel like racism. And so I want to share an article with you, just an excerpt. In the Men Post article by Adman Ahmed, December 4th, 2019, he states this. Most of us agree that Minnesota nice feels like a microaggression. For many people of color, however, Minnesota nice is injurious and on a separate level, it is reminiscent of the racism we have experienced in our lives. The racism of being snubbed, the racism of being ignored when we have sought information, and the racism of being penalized for being opinionated and assertive. Now again, this is one of the main things that we learn as HBCU graduates. And so if you're gonna be recruiting and bringing in HBCU graduates, you need to know right off the bat, they're gonna be very opinionated, they're gonna be self-asserted, and they're gonna have their own opinion. And they're not gonna always go with the flow because they may see something else that might, well, you know what, this might be a better approach. And to, for, for a brand new HBCU grad that works in a corporate environment or whatever environment in Minnesota and, and gives a point counter to the, to the point that the, the, the majority has could, in, could receive an onslaught of challenges uh, from the Minnesota nice passive aggressive approach. And so they're opinionated and assertive. Now again, they, the assertiveness may be perceived as aggressiveness. I cannot tell you how many times when I've heard uh, throughout my career here in Minnesota that you come off aggressive. And I said, well, I'm just being assertive. I mean, do you want me to just go with the flow? Is that what you're saying I need to do? Um, just follow the, the pack, if you will. And so when the offending behavior comes from the dominant group and in effect authorizes or otherizes minorities, it comes across as racist. And here's my point. Given the Minnesota nice is a culture that is deeply ingrained in the Minnesota culture, Minnesota nice is not going to change or go away. What could be done is this. African-American HBCU students, when they come into a corporate setting, should receive training on the culture and learn as best as they can on how to navigate the Minnesota nice culture. So for HR, and, and John had mentioned this about HR, if you're really serious about recruiting HBCU students and African-American employees, there needs to be some level of training about the Minnesota nice culture. And training them as to how to navigate in that space. Because someone that has come from the East Coast or, or from a background where their conversation and their communication is direct, and maybe their, 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 their background is one where they don't have an issue with confrontation. 
that's a real issue in, in the Minnesotanized culture. No confrontation. We can't have any disagreements. We can't have any, any back and forth talking if we're, and so when you have an HBCU graduate, we, as I said before, we tend to be opinionated. We tend to be self-assertive. We tend to be outspoken and we don't have a problem being outspoken. Can I get an amen from an HBCU grad? And so when you're bringing in these fresh, brand new HBCU graduates into the Minnesota culture, there's going to, there will ultimately, if they don't learn the culture, there will be a migration. They will come into, a, I've seen it when I was at General Mills, when I was at other companies where blacks have come into the company and after the year they leave and a number of them leave the state. And so if we're talking about uh, companies and what they could do, they need to be aware that Minnesota NICE is real and provide some level of training for their employees, their black and white employees. I'm gonna add this quick thing because I know we're winding down on time. Um, employers, I want you to know and understand something. When you are pursuing an HBCU grad and you choose to make that person an offer and they accept, you gotta know a couple of things. They're coming with an education that most of you have not received and not just a academic education and an academic rigor. They have a life education and a life education that speaks to culture, that speaks to um, the, the inner workings of the heart, the mind, the body and soul and community engagement. They are enhancing your organization from the mere fact that they attended an HBCU. And you need to keep that in mind that you're not just getting somebody off the street. You're getting a top-notch individual that if given the right resources by you can take your company to a place you might have not thought of before. They will accelerate in many different areas and they will be exceptional above a lot of your different employees. So it is important that we're having this conversation and that you need to put in all of these different things that we're talking about, because I guarantee you that one HBCU grad or the two or the three or the four, wherever they come from, they're culture changers, they're culture shifters. Yes, they're opinionated. Yes, they're gonna challenge the status quo, but they're gonna do it in order to make you better. Beautiful, John. Beautiful. I mean, I, I, I fully agree with that. I mean, when you look at the leaders, the Black leaders, historically, you'll see a number of them have come from HBCUs. Martin Luther King, Morehouse University, Thurgood Marshall, Cheney State, Howard University, Kamala Harris, Howard University. You know, uh, the, the first governor of Georgia, Fam Yu. And so when we talk about when you're bringing in an HBCU graduate, you're bringing in someone that is innately walking, is an, an innate leader, and they will, they will help your company to become better. And I think that is a, a beautiful end to a immensely rich and robust conversation. And I feel like we could spend a lot more time um, discussing this, but I wanted to, uh, we have about four minutes left, but I wanted to extend my gratitude and appreciation to having you, Dr. Miller and John on to, um, to, to really in, engage us in this really important conversation. Again, these may not be conversations we're having in the workplace, or if we are, they're probably just now starting. So I think it was immensely um, gracious of you to share your stories, your experiences, and your insights on how to improve this. And ultimately on the employer's end, it's, it's time for some accountability in this shift. So I, I wanted to ex express my gratitude and thank you so much for the time you spent with us today. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you for, thank you for having us. Of course, of course, thank you. So I'm gonna jump into one last slide before we disconnect for uh, this week's engagement, um, just to highlight what's to come. Um, so uh, jumping uh, right into my, our, our last conversation of this three-part series is going to be hosted next Wednesday, so Wednesday again. Um, however, time shift. We will not start at 9.30. We will start at 10 a.m., so from 10 to 11.30. So there will be 
90 minutes of um, engagement and conversation. And in this session, we will focus on connection and community. If you can't tell, um, these conversations build upon one another. So uh, la last week we, we heard from um, HBC alumni and HBCU Career Services staff about the importance of authentic relationship building and connection. Today we heard about the importance of collaboration, connectivity, um, culture. And then the lastly, connection and community. How are we really plugging into networks that are, are doing the heavy lift and that have existed for a very long time in, in, in creating community um, with HBCU talent and Black talent once they arrive to this region? Um, how can we leverage those networks? How can we um, plug in and engage, but do it in a way that is, bit, that is authentic, that is meaningful, that is purposeful, and that leads to sustainable impacts? Um, so that is what we will discuss in the next session. If you have not registered, um, you will be getting an email about registering for the last session. And if you have any questions, um, uh, please let myself or Emily know. We will uh, send out all the resources via um, uh, email blast as well. But again, I'm really grateful for the important conversation. Courtney, thank you so much for the time you spent with us today. Uh, Dr. Miller and John, we really appreciate Again, your insights, your wisdom, and um, we are better for it because of the conversations that you um, engaged with us today. So um, with that, I would like to uh, conclude our session for today. Thank you so very much. We hope to see you next Wednesday. Again, time change, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And um, we're, we're really happy to be here with you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much.